the tagline for selling condensed matter physics is that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. I think that would be my, my tagline for the subject. The clear example of that is, is a quasi-particle. And I will be more specific. I'll, I'll say the, uh, the phonon is probably an example of what you've asked for. We would describe light as being carried by elementary particles. We can describe sound as being carried by particles, but they're not elementary. Phonon is like a particle of sound, and it can only exist inside crystals. Uh, or, or some other um, states of condensed matter. And you could say, well, it's just the atoms vibrating as the sound travels through, the thing you learned at school, right? Sure, they're an effective description, but mathematically, it's exactly the same thing you do. And I think if you want to believe that photons are real elements of reality, I think you should admit in the same way that phonons are, are fundamental real things in reality. And so I suppose the, the philosophical point I'd want people to, to have as a take-home one for, for this segment is that... Um, Emergent stuff, things where the whole is more than the sum of the parts, uh, things like phonons, that's purely emergent phenomenon, right? It's not present in any one of the atoms there that's vibrating. It's some collective behavior of lots of them, uh, but it's no less real. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome everyone to a magical, very, very mystical episode of the Into the Impossible podcast with I your fearful host, Dr. Brian Keating, joined by a wizard, if ever there was, Felix Flicker, Dr. Felix Flicker, who's joining us from Europe. Felix, how are you today? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It's great to be with you and to be discussing this magical book, The Magic with a K of Physics, Understanding the Fantastical Phenomena of Everyday Life. Felix, you know, because you're an avid listener to the podcast, that I always start each podcast with a discussion of the book cover and its title. But even before that, the actual audio that we start the podcast with is with none other than Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who famously said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So we always open the podcast with that. This book has magic in the cover, and I want to take our readers through the thought process that led you to come up with the title, the graphics, and the conspicuous lack of a dust jacket. Now, yeah. I've always railed against dust jackets because I think they're useless. And the first thing you do is take them off and they just fall into your lap. Of mm -hmm. course, in my first book, the dust jacket was kind of a sample collector for the villain of the book, which is Cosmic Dust. But we're not here to talk about my favorite subject, me. We're here to talk about this book. So do us a favor, please, Dr. Flicker. Explore and explain the title, design, and subtitle of this book in the segment we call Judging Books by Their Cover. Okay, well, I should say, uh, first of all, that most of those things were really the choice of my um, uh, publisher. <laughs> uh, and actually, all of them are different in the UK version, uh, where it was also the choice of my other publisher. Um, uh, the, okay, the dust jacket, that's something I was quite keen on. As you say, I always take the dust jackets off all my books and I just throw them in the bin, actually. At some point, I had a, a drawer full of dust jackets because I was like, oh, I might have to put them back on. And then it had been a few years and I was like, you know what, I'm just throwing them all in the bin. So when it came to having my own book published, I thought, well, it's going to be a bit silly because I'm going to take the dust jacket off my own book and throw it in the bin. So <laughs> you might as well make sure it doesn't have one. Um <laughs> Uh, and the title is The Magic with a K. Yeah, what is that uh, meant to represent? Why, why, is, that, is that a British thing? Like, uh, like uh, you guys spell things, uh, now I'm blanking on something, but uh, what's something no. that you guys spell with a U that we don't? It, it's not. We don't, we don't, we're not that archaic, usually, in the UK. Um, actually, again, the title is different in the UK, although there it's The Magic of Matter, Magic with a CK. In the US, it's The Magic of Physics, Magic mm. with a CK. Um, I guess in both places, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't, um, I didn't exactly choose the title, but, you know, I was involved in the discussion. Um, I think the, the decision was made in both places because we wanted to emphasize that it's magic in a bit more of a literal sense than you might have got if there weren't a K there. So um, if you said something is magic and it didn't have a K on it, I think just from a title alone, you might think someone meant like, oh, it's, it's magic, you know, in a sort of loose sense that we generally mean. Oh, that, that's quite, that was quite magical. Whereas in this case, I'm really trying to draw a fairly direct comparison to, to magic in like fantasy fiction or, or science fiction. 
uh, and, and just generally trying to get at what's magical about things in the world. Um, so we wanted people to understand at a glance from the cover that, uh, that it's meant uh, slightly more um, literally. Uh, I really like the American so I think it's, it, it's very pretty with those patterns on there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautifully bound book. Uh, I, I'm a scholar of that. You should know, though, you shouldn't throw out the dust jackets. Apparently, if you have, say, a rare book like uh, Darwin's Origin of Species or something like that, if it doesn't have the frontispiece or the cover, it's worth 10% <laughs> of I, yeah, the I uh, price with the cover. So, But then I also don't want to um, treasure yeah, so them be, as be, objects. Be, you know, be, I want to treasure them for the words and sights. And I thought, well, if it's devalued to other people, that's probably good for me because it will encourage me to keep hold of it. <laughs> that's right. I read the book uh, in multiple copies of it, and um, I will give away one of the copies eventually to one of my students because... It's not often I have on a theoretical condensed matter physicist. You, you may be one of the few, if, if uh, not only Nicole Younger Halpern, who you reference mm -hmm. in the book, uh, her book uh, was Quantum Steampunk. And it's not exactly about, uh, you know, condensed matter physics, what we're going to discuss today. Uh, but it is nevertheless a, a similar book in that it uses sort of a similar literary devices in terms of um, imaginative openers and, and so forth of each chapter and a, and a thread woven through with, with characters, mystical and otherwise. So mm -hmm. congratulate you on that uh, literary mechanism because it's very captivating. Uh, but we're going to talk about the hard scientific truths of this book. And one of the things amidst the many references to the Lord of the Rings and uh, other things that my reader, my listeners will be delighted to uh, encounter in this book uh, is a discussion of what you call the Philosopher's Stone. And it's sort of the culmination of the book, not giving a spoiler away because the descriptions are worth savoring and reading and listening to, as I did as well. I heard the audiobook as well, <clears throat> which I highly recommend. So you should buy all copies, digital, hard copy, and audio. But it culminates with the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, can you explain what is the Philosopher's Stone to you as a theoretical condensed matter physicist? Okay. I, yeah, we do use this phrase sometimes, and obviously it's in the news a lot at the moment. We, we tend to use it uh, to refer to uh, room temperature superconductors. I mean, we use, we use that, we, we use like the Holy Grail or something. It's like, it's the, the big thing that you always refer to in grants, basically. Maybe that's the accurate way to phrase it. So if you can connect your work to something going on with room temperature superconductors, then, you know, that, then that's an easy way to explain to people that it's important. Um, so I, I, use, I try to use this idea of the Philosopher's Stone because um, I feel like it connects to this idea that, um, well, so, you know, the idea of a, a superconductor is that it's uh, something that conducts electricity perfectly without loss, uh, whereas any typical metal, say, has some resistance. Um, and this means that you can't, that you're always losing electricity, you're losing power when you send it down, down any line over any distance. And, and this is a huge um, obstacle to to a more widespread adoption of things like renewable energy, say, because, you know, we've probably all wondered about trying to cover the Sahara and solar panels and just send the electricity out all around the world. And of course, that's impossible because you, you lose so much of it along the way that it, it wouldn't work. Uh, now, if, if you could make power lines out of superconductors, that would be possible. You could send it as far as you like and you'd lose literally none. So I kind of, I tried to draw this connection to this idea of the philosopher's stone. You know, historically, alchemists were searching for this magical substance, which would um, prevent loss in a more general sense, like they could live forever or, or these sorts of things. Um, and I like the idea that historically um, they were trying to transmute base substances like lead into precious metal, like gold. And you can kind of do that. You, you can't turn lead into gold, but you, you cool lead down sufficiently cold and it does change into a new state of matter, this superconductor, um, and which is arguably much more precious than gold and much more useful, I'd say. So uh, we had uh, encountered each other. I <clears throat> I contacted you a couple weeks ago after the announcement, the startling announcement, although some say it's a re-announcement, of the discovery of a truly room temperature superconductor by a group at the University of Rochester with published peer-reviewed research in Nature, presented at the American Physical Society meeting, uh, the March meeting, and I immediately thought of you, and I asked you, what's going on? So describe the scene. We're going to probably open the podcast with this description. So describe what it was like in the pandemonium, the chaos, 
surrounding this announcement and explain why beyond just the uh, the explanation that you gave of why room temperature superconductivity is so potentially transformative. But what, why was this particular announcement of this discovery so uh, so chaos inducing? Right. Well, <laughs> um, I can I can describe the scene at the the uh, American Physical Society meeting if you like. I mean, that was one of the more exciting things that happened at that meeting. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it's typically renowned for its excitement, but yes, uh, please. I mean, it's it's a very big meeting. It's about ten thousand people go to this meeting every year. Um, it's the the biggest meeting of condensed matter physicists in the world. Um, uh, yeah, so I was uh, there. I bumped. I, you tend to sort of walk around, bump into people you know, um, uh, other physicists, and have a chat about you know what are you working on this sort of thing. And I bumped into a, an old friend from Berkeley, uh, and he said, "Oh, you're going to this uh, this this meeting in a few minutes." Um, and so we went along to it, uh, to the the announcement of room temperature superconductivity. And it was a bit bizarre because there's some of the rooms are massive. You know, there's, there's rooms that are ballrooms um, where famous people will give talks to, you know, thousands of people and set up for that. And then there are, there are rooms that are very small and fit maybe 100 people comfortably. And this was in one of those rooms. Uh, and we got there and... Uh, not only was the crowd, you know, we, we couldn't get anywhere near the room. The, the crowd was covering the uh, the hallway, which is itself a huge thing. It's in a huge conference center. This was in Las Vegas. Um, but there were also security, like, lined up on the door. And this, they tried to claim this was something to do with um, uh, fire safety regulations or something. But uh, when I gave my talk, it was also, it was in the same size room, actually a very close one, on a different day. Uh and, and that talk was also very heavily oversubscribed because it was in uh, information theory. So it was about um, machine learning and people were very interested in that. And again, the crowd was out the door on that one and there's no security. So it wasn't really, uh, I think, you know, maybe they were more prepared for this one. But yeah, so we were in this bizarre situation with security right. sort of shouting at us to get back. It, it felt like a bit of a riot, which you don't normally expect at the March meeting, I have to say. Um, but yeah, so basically... Um, they were making the announcement. Uh, it's been republished in Nature after having to uh, be retracted uh, after claims of, um, uh, I mean, the, the claims were about falsified data, I think. So very serious accusations rather than just um, some accident or something. You know, I, it's it's a very heated debate and not, and not one I feel well enough informed about, but it was retracted from Nature. Now it's republished in Nature. Um, but it was in a sort of smaller room. So, so anyone at who's a member of the American Physical Society can give a talk. Um, anyone, you know, you can talk about, uh, you, you could make a topic up that was, that was definitely, you knew to be wrong and you would still be allowed to give a talk about it at, at this meeting. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but uh, um, somehow it did end up in the small room and, and, and everyone wanted to see the show, but uh, a lot of us didn't get to see it. <laughs> um, so the announcement was made, am I understanding? So, yeah. Sorry, yes. You know, go ahead. Well, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been re-announced. Uh, I, I think um, I, the, 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 okay, a lot of people are very skeptical about it because of what's been happening over the last year or so. Um, others aren't, you know, there, there are some very good condensed matter physicists uh, who I've spoken to personally about it who are, you know, they're, they're not taking a side. They're trying to look at the, the scientific result. And even if it's not a room temperature superconductor, they think there might be something interesting there. There's stuff that can be learned. And I've had some really good conversations with people about um, other stuff that's going on. I think the thing, you know, the thing that will um, seal the deal, if it is true, is if when another group independently verifies the result. And so there are people thinking about that, obviously, because we are scientists and it's not all just a, <laughs> a big fun show at Las Vegas. <laughs> so some of that work's going on now. <laughs> Well, uh, so in preparation uh, for this call, I talked to uh, I talked to you, as I said. <laughs> but then uh, next week, I'm going to be talking with my UCSD colleague, uh, Professor Jorge Hirsch. I don't know if you know. Oh Jorge. yeah, <laughs> I don't know him personally, but obviously he's uh, so Jorge, on the other side. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, yeah, he's yeah. So uh, I'm going to oh, go ahead. Well. Um... I mean, your your listeners will hear it uh, next week from Hirsch, I suppose. But you know, he's he's famously the uh, the counter argument to to the authors of this paper, and he got the first one um, withdrawn basically from from Nature, which you know, I, and I think that's 
uh, it's important that we have that kind of scrutiny for big claims. So, it, yeah, I think it's good that the debate was had, certainly. Uh, so, you yeah, know, it'd be interesting to hear what he has to say about it. Yeah. Just a quick pause to ask you for a small favor while my thumb is occupied with old Albert on it. Yours is presumably freed up to leave a thumbs up on this video. It really helps me a lot with the good old fashioned YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot. Now back to the video. Now the claim, the claim by the Rochester team, Diaz et al. and uh, their team, I've invited him on the podcast as well, but he hasn't replied to me. Um, so, you know, my, my grand design is not to have some, you know, drag out debate fight you know where we turn things into a tawdry brawl but to have some illumination on the subject because as you say it is so important one of my past guests david friedberg uh who's a famous billionaire investor he he actually said on this podcast that yeah he would give his right arm for the discovery of room temperature superconductivity um and then i pointed out well it's been discovered and and he started to get nervous and then he started to say things like oh well uh, it's uh that team has been, you know, uh, controversial before, and and maybe it won't hold up. And I'm, I said, I'm getting the saw out, David. I'm I'm sharpening up the blade. Uh, but uh, but the one thing that he was hanging his hat on is that it's at it's not at um, ambient pressure. So can you speak about that? I mean, one thing that is confusing to me is that um, these these strange lutenites and and so forth, lutinium or whatever it is, um, you know, has to be subjected to this tremendous pressure. And that's somehow seen as disqualifying. But if you look at the pressure inside, a, you know, a ceramic, you know, superconductor, just the internal stress and strain inside of it, how how, would, how is that not the same? You know, it's incredibly high stress strain. Maybe it's not, uh, you know, it's 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 intrinsic. It's not extrinsic. Mm -hmm. Why should that be disqualifying? Simply because you you need to construct, uh, you know, this this kind of static. I mean, it's one thing if it was dynamic. If you right. had a supply you know continuous fluctuations in pressure to keep it at millions of pascal but why is that this why, why do people discount that why is that you know transformative in in the same way that you know room temperature or not room temperature but but um you know liquid nitrogen conduct superconducting objects like uh yibico that those have internal stress strains that are quite high why why do we care about how much external pressure is applied Right. Well, I, I suppose some of that's historical with these things, because it's coming from the community where you're talking about really, really high pressures that. Um, so so the older claims were that uh, they'd made a room temperature superconductor under like really phenomenal pressure. Um, and, and it's such high pressures that you know, it's, it's not realistic that you're going to build a power line out of this stuff. Um, we're talking about um, things you can get in like diamond anvil cells. So you get like. Um, you get diamonds because they're very hard and you can put them under huge pressure and they can maintain their shape roughly and you get them down to a very, very sharp tip and then squash like a tiny amount of stuff with that tip under huge pressure because pressure is force divided by area. So if your area is tiny, then you can get these unbelievable pressures, but only in that tiny little space, certainly not over power lines that do useful stuff. Um, so maybe it's the historical reason for that. So now I, I'm slightly unclear about some of the claims here because... Um, they certainly use the phrase under ambient conditions or something like that. So I think having talked to other people who know a bit more about it, the claim is that they put it under huge pressure, but nowhere near as huge as, as it was before and actually much more achievable under um, uh, more practical conditions. So, so um, maybe if I answer a slightly different question, when you think about um, high temperature superconductors that we already have, like, like IBCO that you mentioned, um, it's... It's high temperature when it can exist above the uh, the boiling point of liquid nitrogen or the boiling point of nitrogen. <laughs> and therefore, you can cool it with liquid nitrogen. Now, that's not anywhere near ambient, right? That's very cold. But we call it high temperature partly because that's so incredibly yeah. practical. Like turning, making nitrogen liquid is, is much, much easier than, say, making helium liquid. And so you can do it under much easier conditions. Mm -hmm. You can carry nitrogen around in... Uh, in uh, um, sort of polystyrene uh, pots, basically, and it's, it makes it far more achievable. So the pressures we're talking about have gone from, you know, not achievable, achievable by a small number of groups on Earth to something that can be done much more readily. But then there's a claim beyond this that I, I think there's a claim beyond this that you make it under these conditions, but then it can actually survive uh, when you take that pressure off. So you have to make it under incredible conditions. But then you can survive with um, without having those extreme environments. I think that's the claim of the ambience, as in you know, ambient means like sort of normal mm -hmm. conditions. And then I think, as you say, it's more like there's an internal pressure, and then you get into questions of 
is this material really stable like that or is it meta stable um my understanding is that the group that's, that's making the claims is already saying it's not reproducible every time it, it's something like a third of the samples can do it or something suggesting that there's more going on it's maybe not like um uh you know it, you can have like crystals where you have periodic arrangements of atoms and then those you know we know that crystals can be stable but then you can have things where there's sort of like patch regions that are superconducting and maybe they're not connecting up something like that um so that would suggest maybe metastable perhaps it can fall apart after some time until people have reproduced this and, and understood all these different things it's hard to make a, a serious comment about it, i think so you uh make a strong case in the book that condensed what we call condensed matter physics which used to be called solid state physics physics which some people call squalid state physics yeah. uh and the mere fact that you you know are only the second or third you know true theoretical condensed matter physicists i have never had a i don't think i've ever had an experimental condensed matter physicist although i do a lot of that for the cooling of superconducting transition edge sensor superconductors for uh, astronomical purposes we basically have a condensed matter physics lab with liquid nitrogen and helium and all sorts of you know dilution refrigerators and uh, you know, superfluids and so forth. But, um, but nevertheless, it's, it's not so well known. And you make the case that it should be more well known. Uh, and I wonder if I could share a vignette. So I went to Brown University for my PhD, where Michael Kosterlitz is. And uh, of course, he's very famous for, you know, sharing the 2016 Nobel Prize mm -hmm. with Duncan Haldane, who makes an appearance in this book, who uh, is a very strange character. And I did interview him for my, my second book, which is around here somewhere. Um, oh yeah, it's right in front of me. So uh, Into the Impossible has an interview with uh, with uh, uh, Duncan Haldane, who was a professor here at UC San Diego before he left for the uh, colder climate of Princeton, New Jersey. Anyway, Leon, uh, who is my quantum mechanics, uh, relativistic quantum mechanics teacher at, at Brown, uh, he pivoted after he won the Nobel Prize. He you'd think he would go into you know even deeper into superconductivity, but he turned to neural networks and and you know kind of early machine learning back in the early 90s uh not you know well it was 20 years after he won the nobel prize but you know 50 or 40 years after he did the work but nevertheless why why do you think if why do you think you know a beginning student would be interested and well served by going into condensed matter physics if some of the most prolific practitioners of that immediately abandon the field <laughs> You yeah. know, as soon as they uh, acquire their their shiny gilded object called the Nobel Prize, uh, what get, give us give us a little bit of of advertisement and promotion, some PR for your field. Okay, well, I would probably I first I point out that I think it's pretty common for someone who wins a Nobel Prize to switch fields dramatically. I think because they're going for another one, right? If you if you won the Nobel Prize in the thing you've been doing, you're not going to win another one in any closely related field. So I think. Um, you know, John Bardeen, who's the only person to win two Nobel Prizes in physics. Um, and, and of course, those were both in condensed matter. Uh, but then my understanding was he was going for a third and he, he was attempting to get one for um, understanding high temperature superconductors, I think. But, you know, that's that's hearsay. But uh, he sort of switched topics repeatedly. Uh, every time he gets a Nobel Prize, he changes again because you're not mm -hmm. going to get another Nobel Prize in that direction. So uh, maybe if he'd have uh, lived longer, he might have uh, made it to three. <laughs> right. That's the... Uh, the <laughs> We call that the hedonic treadmill. You know, when you get some level of fame and success, it's never enough. You just keep seeing wanting the, the number to go up, whether that's money or subscribers or what have you. So yeah, so continue. And I should also point out your countryman um, Brian Josephson, who I'm trying to get on the podcast. He also made a radical pivot and, and now works on uh, theory of consciousness and mind and and is involved with some say quackery and and so forth. But but Leon is still an honest to goodness, you know, uh, workaday scientist. So anyway, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, but okay. besides the Nobel Prize winners, what, what's an advertisement? What's the, what's your pitch, your elevator pitch um, for a young uh, graduate student to pursue theoretical or experimental condensed matter physics? Well, I'd say um, the main thing really is that while people tend not to have heard of it, I'm sure people listening to your podcast will have heard of it because they're you know perhaps better informed about physics, but uh, someone on the street, if you ask them, have they heard of condensed matter physics? The, the answer is always no. Uh, and you ask them if they've heard of gravitational waves or string theory, and they've always heard of those things. Um, but I would, the wow. first point I would make is that uh, uh, a third of all physicists identify as condensed matter physicists, and that's actually more than any other branch of physics. 
So it's the biggest field in physics. And so clearly physicists are seeing something in this subject, which, which is not being communicated to the public. Um, so, you know, uh, I suppose if, if pitching it to graduate students in particular, is that one argument is that there's, a, there's jobs in it, <laughs> which is not necessarily true of string theory anymore. So you know, we're getting a lot of string theorists uh, coming over to condensed matter. Well, I, <laughs> not to start that old uh, argument again, I, I, I have some uh, work going on on string theory as well. So, you know, it, it's both ways. <laughs> But uh, there's always going to be jobs in condensed matter. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd say uh, it's there. There is this this uh, disconnect where physicists know about it, find it interesting, lots of them work on it, but people in the public tend not to have heard of it. And I asked people over the years, why is this? You know, I asked other scientists, I asked like science popularizers and journalists, and the answer was always one of two things, basically. They always, uh, and, and I agree with these two things. One is that um, uh, it's it, you take subjects like astrophysics, gravitational waves, string theory, and there's something like inherently magical about those subjects, uh, which doesn't need explaining. So if you look at the night sky, it's easy to be kind of awestruck by that. If you said, I find that magical, no one would really say, what do you mean by that? I, I don't know what you mean. It's magical, isn't it? You look at the sky, you try and imagine the whole universe, it, it blows your mind. Or you try and imagine like the smallest possible things, like what, what are the elementary building blocks of the universe? And those things are inherently magical in a way that doesn't need explaining. But condensed matter physics is the study of familiar mm. stuff. It's the stuff around us. Like everything we've ever experienced is matter. And the familiar is not obviously magical in the same way. Um, so you need to explain the magic. Uh, so that's one reason. The other reason I think it's less well known is that it's practical. Like th this discovery, if, if they found a root temperature superconductor, that will be put to use within like a year or something. Genuinely, you know, we're already using um, superconducting power lines. It's just to be a matter of switching them over so they don't use liquid nitrogen anymore. And so you might think, well, that's an easy way to sell the subject. But I think it makes it harder because if you talk to someone who works on black holes, say, they can write a book about black holes. And in their book, they explain why they're excited to work on black holes. But if a condensed matter physicist tries to sell their subject, there's always this temptation to say, well, uh, I work on it because I think it's great, but the reason you might think it's great is because it's got these practical applications, like all of electronics relies on condensed matter, your computer, your phone, all this stuff. But that's not why you work on it, right? I'm not working on condensed matter physics because I want your phone to work better, you know, <laughs> no offense. That's a useful byproduct, right. but that's not why I'm excited about it. So I think those are the two problems right. the subject faces. It's practical and it's familiar. And neither of those things seems obviously magical in the way that other subjects in physics are magical. And so that was the cent central idea of the book. I thought, well, why do I find it magical? And I thought, I think, I think those things can be magical. It's just a slightly more subtle form of magic. And then that led me to this idea of sort of, uh, it, it's kind of like what a wizard does, like, uh, you know, a wizard not attempting to be restrictive on who is a wizard, but, you know, you take someone like, uh, Harry or Hermione and Hogwarts, and they're not doing magic on the scale of the whole universe, and they're not rewriting the fundamental laws of reality. They're doing bits of practical hands-on magic that, that helps other characters out. And so I thought, okay, so I think it is magical, but right. we need to explain that uh, a bit more clearly in our subject. So uh, what I love about the book are these illustrations, which, you know, you are a, a calligraphy Maven, uh, you're quite accomplished at that, as well as um, which, you know, I'm grateful to your your publicist uh, for letting me know. But in addition to uh, Shodo or Shodo, probably Shoto, Japanese calligraphy, you're also uh, the former British champion of Shuai Jiao, which is Chinese wrestling. Um, mm. Tell me about this. Why would a wizard need to wrestle? I mean, yeah. so many other magical powers that you can. Uh, that you can uh, <laughs> take part in. So, what what is? Tell me about that. You're the first wrestling champion I've had on the podcast. I've, okay. I've had on Krav Maga uh, practitioners, but never a wrestling champion. What what led to that? And uh, how does it how does it uh, jive with you being a theoretical physicist? Well, I mean, I've been doing um, martial arts for many years. It's uh, actually uh, kung fu I do. Um, so I did that for a long time. Uh, I went to the um, uh, our school went to the national competition and there's various things you can take part in. Um, and uh, I just kind of entered the, uh, <laughs> the Shui Shao on the day. I hadn't really heard of it before, but um, I gave it a go. And yeah, you can just use the same principles. So uh, <laughs> it, it worked out quite well in that case. 
Um, but yeah, it's, um, praying mantis kung fu is what I uh, have done for many years and, and have taught for for many years as well. Um, so actually, that led to also to the uh, Japanese calligraphy. Um, I guess uh, I, I also I'm very into tea, Harry, which a lot of uh, English people are, I suppose. Um, and a friend of mine um, knew. Uh, so this is in Bristol, where I where I live now, and where I did did my PhD years ago. Um, a friend of mine used to um, work at a, a place called Hamilton House, and uh, every Thursday morning in Hamilton House, um, there was a Japanese man would come there, and he would do this uh, thing called uh, Jure Energy Healing, and you would sit there for ten minutes, uh, and and he would hold his hand up and he would shoot healing energy into your face. So this is how my friend explained it to me. And, you know, I, I tried to be open-minded. I, I was like, I don't, I suspect sitting quietly for 10 minutes with your eyes closed is probably the benefit you're getting from that interaction and maybe having someone pay attention to you like that. Uh, but my friend was always adamant about it. So he said, you should go and meet this guy. Um, anyway, uh, it turned out that the, the man's um, uh, wife was uh, is a tea master who can do the Japanese tea ceremony. And, you know, this is like a, similar to martial arts. It takes years of practice to do everything perfectly for this tea ceremony. And he invited me along to, to have the tea ceremony, three of us to go and have it. Um, and during the discussion around that, it turned out that his, uh, his wife was also a, a calligraphy master as well as being a tea master. And I got very excited about this because uh, I'd, I'd, um, I've been doing Kung, Kung Fu for years. Uh, part of that is learning the, uh, the sword, like a Chinese long sword. And I'd understood that the, it's a similar skill using the long sword to, to doing calligraphy. Like it's always portrayed as a quite similar art in films and so on. So I got quite excited about that and asked if they wanted to teach me. Uh, and actually, by the time we got around to doing it, his wife had moved back to Japan, but he he wanted to um, uh, teach me himself. So I, I learned that for a few years. And then when I, I moved to Berkeley in California and um, I found another Japanese calligraphy teacher over there who, uh, who also wanted to, to teach it. So I carried on when I was in San Francisco. Oh, wow. So uh, speaking of tea, well, first I want to relate an anecdote that I, I can't really remember in in its fullness but there's a story of a japanese tea master who's traveling with uh with the emperor somewhere in the 1400s or something and he somehow he besmirches the reputation of a of a um a samurai warrior mm -hmm. and the samurai warrior challenges him to a fight to the death and he doesn't know uh the warrior doesn't know he's actually not a, uh the the man that he's encountering is a very high level official in the Japanese, you know, establishment. Uh, and he also doesn't know he's this tea master. And so the tea master is terrified and he says, oh, I'm going to die. And he starts complaining to the emperor and the emperor says, agree to fight, show up tomorrow and don't flee. You'll, you'll, your, your life will be over if you flee, but do start your day as you would normally. And we'll see what happens. And the samurai warrior witnesses him making tea, which as you know, is a very elaborate, process in Japan and elsewhere. And um, when he does it, he, uh, the Japanese warrior says, I refuse to fight you. Even if you don't know anything about samurai sword fighting arts and so forth, you are so accomplished in this tea preparation that your mind is far sharper than my sword. And so he surrenders and they become BFFs. Um, the reason I bring this up is I, I, th I think there is a book written by my namesake, Brian Keating, <laughs> And it's called How to Make Tea. Huh. And uh, people confuse me with that author. Unfortunately, he's passed away very young, uh, sadly. Uh, but I have that book because I always support people named Brian Keating. <laughs> uh, and I hope everyone will do that as well, except support the living Brian Keating, perhaps, by buying my books. And the Brian Keating book is called How to Make Tea. And I, I was like, well, what's the big deal? You know, I was supporting a friend, you know, or someone with the same name. But I read it and it's quite intricate. And it goes through the different types of boiling water that are necessary to make different types of tea. Mm -hmm. And you recount that in your book. And I, I want to use that as a springboard to talk about phase transitions. Okay. Because I always heard, you know, phase transitions are sort of, you know, it's kind of like the, the Supreme Court in America defined pornography as you'll know it when you see it. I was like, well, how much can there really be, at, you know, at standard temperature and pressure to, <laughs> about different types of, of water for tea? I just boil it and dump it in a cup. I'm, a, you know, I'm an American. <laughs> I drink uh, the most American beverage of all, Tab. I drink Tab. Uh, but but tell me, Felix, what what is a phase transition? Is it is it you know it when you see it? Because 
It seems to me that there's many different definitions and not all scientists seem to agree on it. So how do you think of phase transitions? Why are they important? Okay. I'm, can I relate an anecdote quickly before that? Is that, uh, it's related? Of course, it's your show. <laughs> yeah, it's your show. Uh, you've reminded me that, um, so when you, uh, as, when you apply to be an undergraduate in Oxford, you have to go to these interviews, right? And they last for several days. My mind was five days, actually, of, of being sat in a room and be called up to interview. Five um, days. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's pretty, I don't know if it's, as, yeah, it's That's still hard. about as thorough these days, it's still about three days. Um, I had a five day one. But um, oh, one of the interviews was uh, with two tutors and, and they asked what is now a classic interview question, which is, um, uh, you've, you've got some uh, hot tea and you need to go out soon. So you're going to add the, add the milk at some point to cool it down. Should you add it sooner or later to, to get the tea to drinking temperature faster? Um, and I didn't know the answer. I was trying to buy time. So I answered that etiquette dictates that you have to put the milk in first regardless. So I, <laughs> I wasn't going to, <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't uh, put it in second because that wouldn't be allowed. Um, and, and I tried, I, I kept on that line for about two attempts of them to, to get me to the answer while I was trying to think. And eventually one of, one of the tutors was American and he said, okay, look, I'm, I'm an American. Just imagine it's American coffee and nobody cares about etiquette. <laughs> so uh, that, that was his way around that. <laughs> um, sorry, so yes, phase transitions. Um, I mean, they get to the heart of the, the magic in condensed matter physics, I think, because I, I think, um, like, so when you think about what it is to do physics, I, the way I think of it, certainly theoretical physics, is kind of spotting hidden connections, I'd say, um, in the world. Take two phenomena that seem to normal people to be completely unrelated and spot that they're actually connected by kind of hidden secret routes. And isn't that ultimately what, what you do in magic as well? Like, the, I, I think any way you try and think of magic, be it like um, in, in, in fantasy fiction or, you know, if, if you've got some magician trying to present stuff, I think they're always trying to find these hidden connections between things. And, and, and um, phase transitions are, are the epitome of this, right? Because they, they embody this idea of um, universality, that totally unrelated physical systems behave identically at phase transitions. So the, the classic example, and one I mentioned in the book, um, is it's, it's water boiling to steam, uh, but under pressure. So it has to be under a very high pressure, a specific high pressure, um, for it to, to go through a phase transition at what's called a critical point. Um, now, that same behavior you get at that, that critical point is, is then uh, the same as when um, a magnet stopped being magnetic. So you can take a, um, a ferromagnet, something that's magnetic by itself, um, and, and if you heat it up beyond a specific temperature called its Curie point, then above that, uh, it stops being a ferromagnet. It starts being a paramagnet, which is not magnetic by itself, but can become magnetic when you put it in a magnetic field. And the way in which it stops being magnetic uh, is the same as the way that uh, water stops being a liquid and starts being a gas at its critical point. And that's, you know, if, you, if someone told you that... Uh, uh, water turning into steam and a magnet stop being a magnet, those were, were like described by identical mathematics. I think you wouldn't naturally have believed them. We wouldn't have believed them before, before uh, they, they work in condensed matter physics on that subject. And so, you know, when I say that they're the same, um, what you get is um, you get this kind of universal behavior, like you can measure certain properties of the system. You look at how they change as a function of some parameter. So with uh, water turning into steam, you can look at the um, the density. That That's uh, something that, you know, water is denser than steam. You look at how the density changes as a function of temperature, uh, and you'll find that um, it, it behaves as a power law. Um, the, the density goes as a as the temperature to raise to some power. And the power is some totally random number. It's something like 0 0.326 or something. And we can measure what this number is. And you might say, okay, maybe... Oh, and then, sorry, if you measure the magnetization of a magnet as, as it stops being magnetic. Um, similarly, it's, it's governed by the same um, power. And you say, okay, so there's some magical like constant of reality there. It's like the speed of light or something. But it's not really. That's the thing. It's just, it's just some number. It's, it's not some combination of pies or e's or anything like that. And, and it, it's, it's really just uh, the fact that it's this kind of random number is the in really interesting thing because there was nothing that said, all right, it's not some combination of known fundamental constants that gives you that thing. They're just coming out exactly the same. And that's, that's the really mysterious thing. When you measure these two unrelated things carefully, you find that they're, they're really 
uh, ultimately like we think of them in the same way now and that's that's uh, the, the magic of phase transitions i'd say so um the other thing i often kind of get into arguments about with my condensed matter friends or um are, are others is the degree to which you know theory experiment and technology become sort of conflated with one another i mean we often hear things like well if you know if it wasn't for quantum mechanics we wouldn't be able to talk on an iphone because mm -hmm. you know an iphone has 14 you know trillion transistors in it and uh because of that that's the transistors quantum mechanical but a if you look at the very first transistor you know and you talk about it in the book uh but you look at it it looks like it doesn't look like something a wizard would make <laughs> it looks like something you know my my uh four-year-old would make you know after i've deprived her of sleep for a couple you know it's got coat hanger and chicken you know chicken wire it's got some chewing gum and it's got this you know ginormous crystal you know which you're you know philosopher's stone maybe you might think of it as it doesn't look anything like an iphone uh, moreover, I, I claim, and, and you have, by the way, you have one of the best descriptions of how a transistor works. I think it should be, you know, included for, for all, uh, beginning, uh, undergraduates uh, you should, you should be very much congratulated, Felix. It's, it's a, one of the best descriptions I've ever heard and it's poetic as the book is, and it's, it's accurate scientifically and it's just, it's just dead on and it. I give it the highest commendation, Felix. I wish I could have done it. Yeah. So that's the highest encomium you'll ever, you'll ever receive, my friend. Thank you. Uh, but the uh, transistor, they didn't look at, oh, here's the Schrodinger equation mm -hmm. and uh, let's apply it. And boom, here's a, you know, we can use, uh, you know, we can take Instagram selfies. Um, what do you make of this? Like, in other words, how does the basic physics, the path to, from basic physics to, you know, or fundamental physics, condensed matter, quantum mechanics, to technology is is completely it's almost incalculable how how it comes about but a lot, but people simplify it and they say well if you don't believe you know uh, in uh, in general relativity if you think the earth is flat you know don't use your gps uh, you know so anyway what, to what extent do we really ever look at the fundamental laws to make technology i claim it's almost never but i i might be wrong um i wouldn't say never um no, I, I think we do. It, I, I think we do it quite a lot in condensed matter. If I'm honest, <laughs> so uh, maybe that's maybe that's a controversial. It's funny because Duncan, when I had Duncan on, sorry to interrupt. When I had Duncan Haldane on, he was like, you know, you should do things that are useless. He said, like my mm. in my discovery, you know, of topological matter uh, with Kosterlitz and Thales, you know, it'll never it'll never result in a better iPhone. But that's not why we did it. So anyway, go on. Hmm. So so give me some examples of where we look into a fundamental law like. Here's QCD, or, or here's a Feynman diagram, and out pops technology. Uh, as I said, I'm taking the counter example of I don't think it ever happens. But, but right. tell me, what what are your thoughts? Okay, well, I wouldn't say it works like that. That you you look at the theory and, and the uh, result pops out. But um, you know, the first I think one of the examples I give in the in the book of an early uh, electronic device was uh, this um, point contact rectifier. I mean, it's maybe the kind of thing you were referring to a second ago, where um, uh, I, I think like American GIs in, uh, in, in the Second World War managed to improvise an electronic device without realizing it by kind of creating a semiconductor, again, without knowing it, by, um, uh, which created a sort of a, what's called a, a foxhole radio, I think. Um, and the, the thing is, you know, they did this with uh, remarkably little stuff. They basically just had some headphones, um, a safety pin, <laughs> uh, and... and um, they they could make a, a, what turned out to be an electronic device. Now the problem is, okay, you you have got the basis of of a working uh, um, electronic device there, but they didn't know that at the time. And I think before it started being kind of commercially useful, that the this became the transistor later on. You had to understand what was going on and why that thing worked, because it only worked a tiny percentage of the time. Uh, and and part of that was we had no idea why it was working. So you you, you to get you from the stage where you've got you you're pushing two things together and sometimes you're getting a radio signal in your headphones to having a functioning radio that works very well. We really did have to understand many body physics to, to understand that, the, you know, the, the quantum mechanics of many um, uh, particles at once. 
Uh, and I don't think that's a, an overstatement. You know, it, it's not a coincidence that uh, we started developing that many body theory in the 1950s and then the, the transistor comes about also in the 1950s. It's, it's not like um, random. I, I, if I take an example that's maybe a bit more um, timely now, if you look at the development of um, or attempts to develop quantum computers, I think that's a really good place to look. Um, I mean, looking at all this in a bit of a more meta way, I think the Kinetic metaphysics more than other subjects has this, um, like, because it's practical on a sort of shorter time scale, it, it tends to get um, a lot of like industry funding. Again, something that makes it look very unmagical, I think. But if you look at a lot of the brilliant discoveries in the 20th century in condensed matter physics, lots of them came out of places like, um, uh, why is my mind gone blank all of a sudden? The um, uh, Bell Labs. The Bell Labs. Bell Labs, Bell Labs or... of, yeah. So, you know, and again, it, uh, the important thing with Bell Labs is first, it's got loads of money. Uh, but second, they allowed blue sky research, much like how they was saying, you know, they, they just let people spend, they got clever people, gave them the money to, um, uh, to be able to, to do work they wanted to and let them work on stuff that, that seemingly had no point whatsoever. And then it led to many Nobel Prizes, lots of these, these cheering awards and so on, um, all sorts of stuff. Now, somewhere where that's happening today, you know, Bell Labs was, was ultimately funded out of money from uh, um, the, the telecommunications industry. You know, it came from uh, Alexander Graham Bell, ultimately. Uh, I mean, I, th I think the, it was more Bell's emphasis on the fact that he did kind of stuff that he said he felt was pointless and it led to one of the most important inventions uh, uh, in the modern world. But um, so to take a, a, a kind of current example, there's loads of money now going into quantum computing. Uh, that's you know huge investment, it, and it's this really nice marriage of uh, theory and experiment. You know, there's they're taking on theorists. There's uh, but there's also like a um, uh, a kind of engineering side to it. So we don't have a, a kind of scalable quantum computer that can, okay, we're doing some practical stuff, but you know, it, it's not certainly not something people are using day to day for any useful purpose. Um, but the approach is to try and make it practical technology. There's, there's the engineering side where you just, um, you, you just try and do better and better. And then there's the theory side, which says, okay, maybe a totally different approach could lead to you know, something which is much simpler to, to create through engineering. And the way I've interacted with this subject is through attempts to make a topological quantum computer, which is an arguably a very theoretical approach. Maybe it's not even the most practical one anymore. It's a very mm -hmm. fast developing field, but it's, it's not implausible that that could be a good approach to it. And so my former colleague, uh, Steve Simon, is you know, a, a, a well-known expert on, on things related to this. And, and the way he phrased it is that um, if you want to harness quantum mechanics you know, at a um, to build a, something practical like a quantum computer. Well, quantum mechanics only really works in, you know, you can only maintain quantum coherence in, in like very cold, very clean systems. It, it's, it's, um, it's very easy to lose this, uh, this magical property of quantum mechanics that makes it useful. And so he said, there's two approaches to this. One is the engineering approach where you try to minimize the noise, the, the noise being, you know, the, the messiness, the, the temperature, the, uh, so you try to make things very cold, you make them very clean. That's the engineering approach. The other approach is to make the system somehow deaf to the noise. So rather than just like minimize the noise, you just make it so that the noise is there. You don't care about it at all because you've made something that doesn't care about the noise. And, and that one of the approaches to that then is, is topological quantum computers. And I think maybe Haldane was uh, underselling himself if he said that this stuff is never going to be useful. Um, I think there's always an eye with the Nobel Prize being awarded to, to it actually having some practical uses. It tends not to go to something that's that's totally um you know totally theoretical uh and and i think like the the, the 2016 sorry 2016 um nobel prize that you've, you've mentioned a couple of times now that that was for topological matter and i think it is going to have practical effects you know i might be dreaming there but um i i, I think things the, the fact that it's been taken seriously by people putting money into quantum computing whether or not it ends up being the practical technology that leads to it uh, I think it shows that there is this this connection, and then that's really fundamental theory playing into practical technology. I would say so. I think there's, they're not totally disconnected, but I agree it probably is oversold in a lot of places as well. And I want to ask you. We're going to get to you know questions because uh, it's getting late. That uh, over there in Europe where you are, and you're so gracious to 
stay up late uh, on a on a Thursday. Uh, but I do want to ask you, you know, my existential questions, which will have some tie into your work and especially the application of Arthur C. Clarke's quote on technology and magic. But before we do that, uh, I guess the the last thing that kind of resonates throughout the book is, are, is sort of this discussion of knots and and knots as this device. So wh what is it about knots that is uh, so perhaps applicable in terms of things like quasi particles? Is it merely a device? Is it merely a mathematical analog? You know, as Hilbert wonder, you know, uh, you know, and uh, and others about uh, the fundamental laws. Wigner's famous statement that you know mathematics is unreasonably effective in physics. So, what what is this device of knots? Why are they so important to you? And do they play a, a role in your research as a theoretical condensed matter physicist? Mm -hmm. Well, they're certainly very inspirational things. Uh, I think they were quite a, an easy way to explain the idea of topology. You know, when that Nobel Prize was awarded, uh, you saw all these journalists attempting to explain what topological matter is. <laughs> and it, it was a very hard task. <laughs> some achieved it, you know, some, some maybe less so. Um, California bagel or something? Yeah, yeah lot, lots of discussion of, uh, of bagels and, and oranges and so on. Um, knots, I think, make it, make, the, make it quite intuitive what's meant by topology, right? Because so a mathematical knot is just like one you tie in your shoelaces. But you take the two free ends and you stick them together. And so if you imagine like a little a string, like a shoelace, uh, and you can take it, and you can just stick the two ends together like that. And that's what gets called an unknot because it's, it's the simplest knot. It's like unknotted. You can think of it like sort of like zero of knots, if you imagine. And it actually looks like a zero as well, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. but then you can take it and you can duct, kind of tie the simplest knot you can imagine and, and put the two ends together. Um, and the sim the, so the next simplest one after that is the, uh, the trefoil knot. Um, and you can just see that, like, there's without cutting the string, um, you can you can move it around as you like. But as long as you don't cut it and rejoin it, that thing is going to be fundamentally different to the case of the the unknot. So one one looking like this, the other one weaving around and then rejoining. And there are many different ways you can do this. So the, I think the, the one of the main reasons I, I emphasize them heavily in the book is that there's a very natural connection to this idea of magic. I think I find them quite inspirational. Um, these knots. Uh, they're, they're present throughout uh, various cultures. You know, we, we all we all use them. Um, I'm getting married next week, and the uh, the uh, wedding ring is like an oh, example wow. of a, a closed loop, trying to symbolize infinity and and connection between two people, and so on. It's, you know, people um, take padlocks. Oh, wedding ring, of one. course. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. And a knot on your hand. <laughs> Although you know what I call you know what I call the wedding ring, Felix. I it might not. be too late, but. It's also known as the world's smallest handcuff. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, historically. Just kidding, honey. My, 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 wife won't, my wife won't like that. My wife does not like that. But luckily, she doesn't listen very often. I see. Just kidding, honey. Uh, go on, Felix. So congratulations before I forget. Well, that's, an amazing, that's an amazing. That's an amazing. And that'll truly be a transformative moment for your life and a phase transition for you and your, and your bride-to-be. Uh, but but none as radical as when you guys hopefully have kids. But anyway, please continue. <laughs> well, yeah. So there are um, sort of hand binding ceremonies and stuff for, for weddings. So it's not uh, it's not unrelated this idea of um, uh, of knotting. So it's something that I think people can appreciate uh, more generally. And yeah, they do play an important role in condensed matter physics. Um, uh, classifying the different types of knot. If you just imagine, okay, I can take the thing and stick it together, or I can take it and I can do this thing and stick it together, or I can do something more complicated. Which of those ones can I transform into which other ones? That's a fun mathematical problem um, and, and quite a deep one. Yes. Um, they do play a role in condensed matter physics. I mean, essentially, uh, the topological quantum computation I mentioned um, is entirely, we think of it in terms mm -hmm. of knots. Now, that the way to make these knots is, um, I guess your readers are familiar with uh, things like creating particle antiparticle pairs out of the vacuum right is that is that a, a totally crazy oh, yes. to start my, with? my audience is the most brilliant in the known multiverse yes that's right okay mm -hmm. so we can, we can create so if you have time going up this way and you know this is space down here on a plane then we can create a particle antiparticle pair pull it apart and re-annihilate it right and you can think of that as the unknot then in in uh um in in space time you know you, uh, okay and there's famous well no i'm not going to say that <laughs> I won't start talking about things going back in time. You create the pair, you pull it apart, you stick it together again, unknot. Now, 
the, the, the things we would try and make a topological quantum computer out of are bizarre particles that can only exist in matter, as far as we know, where you can create them and you can create another pair and you can take these two and you can switch them around, switch their places. I think in some cases you can even switch them back again. Now you try and take these two. It was, it was created as a part particle-antiparticle pair. You take this one, you pass it around something else over here. And now you try and push them back together again and they won't go together. And the reason they won't go together is because they're no longer a particle-antiparticle pair. So this one, by virtue of having gone around something else over here, has ceased to be the antiparticle of the thing that it used to be. And so in a very simple way, then you can mm. see that, okay, if I'm looking, following the braids that I'm making in this time direction, um, I've, I've made something more complicated. It actually tends to be called like a link, is when you have two different knots linked together, or something like this. And by doing that, you can make it so that things can't annihilate. And so you can, and one way to look at it is you've kind of encoded a history in, in the movement of these particles. And the nice thing is that these particles can now, you, there's noise in the system, there's finite temperature making them shake around, or there's disorder in the, the medium that they're being created in. But it doesn't care. As long as the, the topology of the knot stays the same, then the quantum information can be encoded in the same way, in this way that is robust to, to that noise. And you see, it's the same as taking a, a, a shoestring, tying it in some knot and sticking the ends together. I can move it around as much as I like, as long as I don't actually break it and rejoin it. And it's still the same knot. And so essentially, that is the, the key. Yeah. Uh, massively simplified, but the basis of, of how to approach topological quantum computation, which could be a very practical technology. Okay, so we are back. All right, Felix, we've come to the denouement, where the wizards have to make their journey back to the coven. I guess you, you, you taught me that uh, uh, a, a collective noun for wizards is uh, an argument. Is that right? That's what Terry Pratchett said, yes. It sounds about right for academics, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds better than uh, a plural of turkeys, which is the rafter. I don't know how that came to be. Okay. Um, and lawyers, I, I, I've heard maybe incorrectly, lawyers are... A coven, a coven of lawyers. Anyway, uh, at the end of each uh, interview, I love to ask my guest uh, some questions, and these are existential questions. These are uh, meant to evoke in the listener uh, something, uh, something provocative, perhaps. And I want to ask you this question that I really started off the interview with, which is Sir Arthur C. Clarke's famous statement that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, sometimes it can be inverted that any sufficiently advanced magic is indistinguishable from technology. Uh, but, uh, but in any case, I want to ask you, and, and this is kind of in the lines of Richard Feynman's um, famous cataclysm question, which was, uh, he was asked, well, what, what statement contains the most information in the fewest words about the physical world? And he said that everything's made of tiny whirling atoms that are uh, little miniature systems of of subatomic particles were acting in concert. I want to ask you kind of a similar type of question. Um, if all in all the exploration in your field, uh, what have you come upon that's sort of the most magical? Uh, if there is a you know sui generis, uh, if there is a particular fact that you think is deserved of a Feynman type cataclysm question, you know, in, in other words, something that would endure and maybe have give reason for humans to have swagger <laughs> so the meandering question is what is the most impressive form of magic that wizards like yourself have come up with in your estimation hmm. okay there's a few i'd like to say uh um yeah the, like as many as you like i suppose okay so if i boiled the subject down to its essence i would say that that the, the tagline for selling condensed matter physics is that it's uh it's cases where um, uh, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. I think that would be my, my tagline for the subject. And all the uh, fundamentally exciting phenomena you're asking me about, I think they all embody that very clearly. Um, let's see. I, mean, I, I think personally, probably the thing I'm really excited about is um, when we think about what is condensed matter physics, Again, it's not really it's not really material science, right? It's fundamentally different to that. It's not chemistry, although it has some overlap. It's not engineering, but there's overlap with that. At the theoretical end, there's philosophy. It's not that, but it has all, bits of all these things. Mm -hmm. I had to think about what's what's a thing that is just pure condensed matter physics and doesn't appear in any other branch of physics. 
Uh, and I think that um, the clear example of that is, is a quasi-particle. And I will be more specific. I'll, I'll say the, uh, the phonon is probably an example of what you've asked for. So uh, the way I try to explain these in, in simple terms, a, pho you know, a photon is a particle of light. When we just give light its quantum description, we can say a beam of light is made up of individual particles uh, called photons. Now, uh, sound doesn't have that property. You can have you know, sound waves, but sound is not described uh, typically by elementary, well, it's not described by elementary particles, right? Um, one way to say this is what do we mean by an elementary particle? Well, you could say it's something that can exist by itself in the vacuum of space and can't be reduced to other things with that property. So light is an example of that, a photon. An atom can exist in space, but it can be reduced to electrons, protons, and neutrons. So that wouldn't be an elementary particle in that sense. Now, you can see that rules out sound because sound can't travel through space. So you're done. Um, so there can be no elementary sound particle. But actually, sound can travel through any matter, right? And when it yes. travels through um, a crystal, say, uh, we can describe it ex in exactly the same way we describe light as being carried by elementary particles. We can describe sound as being carried by particles, but they're not elementary. And, and these are what we call mm -hmm. phonons rather than photons. So a phonon is like a particle of sound, and it can only exist inside crystals uh, or, or some other um, states of condensed matter. And you could say, well, it's just the atoms vibrating as the sound travels through the thing you learned at school, right? But the, thing I, right. the reason I think the subject is really so magical is that actually, if you look at the, the description of these things using quantum field theory, it's exactly the same emergent description that you use for um, describing particles like light, you, you know, the standard model of particle physics. It's still effective field theory, right? You know, you, you'll know a lot more about this than I will from the the, the cosmology side, astroparticle physics. It's the, the standard models, uh, an effective field theory. It's a description of, of these particles. Um, sorry, I, I lost you for a second. Um, yeah, and and so in exactly the same way, phonons. Sure, they're an effective description, but mathematically, it's exactly the same thing you do. And I think if you want to believe that photons are real elements of reality. I think you should admit in the same way that phonons are, are fundamental, real things in reality. And so I suppose the, the philosophical point I'd want people to, to have as a take home one for, for this segment is that um, emergent stuff, things where the whole is more than the sum of the parts, uh, things like phonons, that's purely emergent phenomenon, right? It's not present in any one of the atoms there that's vibrating. It's some collective behavior of lots of them, uh, but it's no less real. Because all of your, everything you've ever experienced, that is emergent. And so I think it's sort of backwards to say, oh, the real things are like the elementary particles. The emergent stuff is just something that comes out of that. I, I'd say it's the other way around. I'd say you, your reality you experience all the time is, is real. It's certainly real to you. Um, uh, and I think that should be taken more seriously. Does that sound like a good, uh, good answer for this section? Yeah, that's very good. And I like that you brought in uh, the concept of diversity which, you know, is overused, in my opinion. We, we hear so much about it in the States. I'm sure it's the same, same in Europe, but it's obviously important. But, you know, diversity for its own sake is, is not necessarily, you know, a pure, unalloyed, un, uh, you know, benefit. I mean, you know, one of, my, one of my friends likes to say, you know, if you have diversity in the UK, uh, uh, you know, you think driving on the left is, is really great but you think it should be diverse. We have people driving on the right at the same time. You know, that's not going to be so great. Uh, but when it's done in service of something greater, such as, you know, elevation of a community um, by having multiple viewpoints from practitioners with different backgrounds. And I, I really appreciate that you brought that in. And it really did make me think about how in the mission of this book is in concert with Philip Anderson's kind of observation that more is different. Mm -hmm. It's not better. It's not necessarily worse. Uh, it might not be fundamental, but it's composite. And to me, it seems like you could apply that as sort of a theme of the book, that more people from diverse backgrounds is going to be different. And, and hopefully that'll add to the collective endeavor of the magic that we call physics. Uh, and this is such a delightful book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. As I said, I give it the highest encomium possible, which is I wish I wrote several of its uh, segments. So Felix Flicker, we'll have links to your wonderful Royal Institution talks. I'm going to be there in June to give a talk there of my own. I'm going to have to hit you up for some, uh, for some tips on how to give a conversation like that at the site of my hero, Michael Faraday, 
and the experiments and magnetism and fields that you describe in this wonderful book. I'll need your help because I'm talking about cosmic polarization and its rotation uh, through things like magnetic fields in the primordial universe. Mm -hmm. So look forward to that. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. And I wish you most of all uh, great luck and success in your upcoming nuptials. That kind of a bonding of two quasi particles <laughs> uh, is the most elemental and it is the most beneficial to the furthering of, of humanity. So I can't congratulate you highly enough. It's great you came out with this wonderful book before the wedding. Otherwise, you'd be working on it on your honeymoon. So, my friend Felix Flicker, I'd like to know you and I hope we get to meet in person someday. Thank you. Thanks for having me.